In the 21st century, our globalized, interconnected world is changing more rapidly than at any other time in human history. In the last hundred years, we have seen a doubling of human life expectancy. In the same period, the global population has risen from less than 2 billion people to nearly 7.5 billion. Technological innovation allows us to travel from one side of the planet to the other in a matter of hours and to communicate instantaneously. Amidst these dramatic changes, we face catastrophic challenges. Poverty, climate change, population growth, biodiversity and species loss, disease and conflicts with increasingly dangerous weapons, which leave huge numbers of our 21st century human community destitute, hopeless and helpless. We live in an age where, unfortunately, the number of humanitarian crises is escalating. Both man-made and natural conflicts and the crises are on the rise. We are still grappling with the previous crisis and suddenly something else comes up, you know. We are in front of something that certainly uh, is, is an unprecedented crisis. We have the largest displacement of people since the Second World War. The longer you go with the humanitarian crisis, the more needs and requirements come out or surface. There will be more efforts required, there will be more humanitarian assistance required in the next upcoming years. Globally, the budget for responding to these horrible, complex emergencies is very, very stretched. And more of the development dollar is having to be spent on the very short-term relief. So you can provide immediate response in terms of food and shelter. But what about the infrastructure? What about the, all other things, the health, education, and all of that uh, other supportive elements, uh, which are essential for a good quality of life? Right? These issues, in the context of the global village in which we now live, threaten all of us. It is not possible to contemplate that we are going to have peace, stability, progress when you're having these uh, aberrations, these dreadful catastrophes. In order to meet these challenges and ensure our future is one of prosperity, opportunity and human dignity for all, we require an attitude of shared responsibility for global problems, a respect and empathy for our neighbours around the world, a mindset of togetherness and fraternity across our global community. In order to achieve this, we need leadership which can inspire change and galvanise the international community to work together putting others before themselves. In September 2014, the United Nations honoured His Highness the Emir of Kuwait, Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jaba Al Sabah, for his global humanitarian work. It is a recognition of Kuwait's extraordinary partnership with the United Nations and other international organisations, and its extensive and ongoing humanitarian work around the world. Kuwait's leadership and funding has saved tens of thousands of lives and has galvanized others to participate in coordinated international action. It is good to know that we can count on Kuwait's generosity and particularly His Highness Emir of Kuwait. Such solidarity and generosity is needed more than ever. I urge more states in the world to come forward with assistance. We're extremely grateful to uh, His Highness the Emir of Kuwait for the tremendous commitment and support that he has shown to humanitarian action around the world and the leadership uh, that he has shown. There would not be so much opportunities for us to do our job without uh, this leadership, without convening the pledging conferences and without the the financial contribution that uh, the UN has received. I think the Secretary General recognised the Emir of Kuwait as an outstanding humanitarian leader simply because he is. Kuwait is a generous country when it comes to helping people in need and it's important that that gets global recognition. It was exceptional. One of the memories that I will cherish to, 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 to my grave, uh, you know, the feeling I will never forget, the reception in the UN, a very heartfelt uh, uh, talk that His Highness gave. I have goosebumps now just even remembering it. It, 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 it 
was, it really was something historic. Your Highness, we thank you and count on your continuous support and leadership. I personally felt it was basically a very small gesture from my side to say thank you to someone who's leading the way. His Highness the Emir served the country of Kuwait as foreign minister from 1963 until 2003, in which time he was a pillar in the restoration of Kuwaiti international relations after the Gulf War. He also took on the role of Deputy Prime Minister and First Deputy Prime Minister in the year 1985 and 1992 respectively, before becoming Prime Minister in 2003 and the Emir of Kuwait in 2006. Throughout his journey, he has served his country with vision and dedication and represented his people as a benevolent leader. The people of Kuwait are natural when it comes to helping those in need. In 1954, the People's Committee was established as a charity organization. The honorary chairperson was, and still is, His Highness Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jabbar Al Sabah. That NGO highlighted the cultural role of Kuwait by aiding those inside Kuwait and abroad as well. One of the first institutions that was established in Kuwait uh, immediately after independence, Kuwait independent was in, in June of 61, and the establishment of the Kuwait Fund by law with Arab countries then, then expanded more to cover non-Arab countries. And when, when we were working, we worked in parallel with other sister organizations, which is the Authority for the South. They, are, they were working on social sector. We were more working in economic sector. If you go and you investigate, you will find that the first school was built in, in Dubai, was from Kuwait, and the first clinic, the first hospital, the first uh, university. We have a long tradition of giving, of, of unconditional giving, really. Um, it cuts down to our bone. If you go back to Kuwait's history, before the discovering the oil, it has been a poor country. So having to help your neighbor, having to help the person across the street is something common that they had. They grew up doing this. Then it was the discovery of the oil. God gave us this wealth. One way to thank God is really to help the people of God all over the world. In exploring Kuwait's humanitarian benevolence over the last century, we notice that this small nation and its leader have consistently been at the front line of the world's largest natural disasters, man-made conflicts and developmental aid challenges. One of the largest natural disasters in recent history in which Kuwait played a leading role was the tsunami that followed the Indian Ocean earthquake on 26 December 2004, which killed approximately a quarter of a million people. The earthquake was the third largest ever recorded on a seismograph, reaching 9.1 magnitude and triggered a tsunami that affected 14 countries on its destructive path. Banda Aceh in the northern province of Indonesia was the closest major city to the earthquake's epicenter. And the story was marked in history as the costliest estimated relief operation at that time. It was a Sunday morning, Sunday, December 26th. The earthquake hit Arche and all of us were really shocked. Everything was shaking. We couldn't even stand up. About five minutes after the earthquake, I saw people running up the street. As they were running, somebody said, there's water coming. The water was up to the roof. It hit my house and destroyed it. When the water came onto land, I saw a house explode. Then I saw a container and I jumped on and got washed out to sea and ended up five kilometers down the coast. My body was covered in wounds. When I went back to Banda Aceh to see the aftermath, I couldn't believe my eyes. There were ruins from houses and dead bodies everywhere. Governments and NGOs feared that the final death toll might double as a result of diseases, creating an even bigger need for an immediate large-scale humanitarian response. One of the first responders was from a small nation with a population size equivalent to 1.5% of Indonesia's population. We were the first ones to go there on the day after, and when we arrived, people were stunned. 
since some had lost all of their family. Approximately 250,000 people died during this disaster. We received instructions from Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jaba Al Sabah, the Emir of Kuwait, may Allah protect him. We were to take immediate action to provide relief to these countries. Kuwait played an active role by providing immediate aid relief in the aftermath to help reduce suffering and bring stability for the devastated communities of the affected countries. We began coordinating with the Indonesian Red Cross, making a list concerning the refugees' needs. After that, the Kuwait Red Crescent Society began sending aid, such as clothing, tents and food. We got a lot of aid from Kuwait, such as generators, fishing boats and water tanks. They donated lots of them. We brought in more than 50 machines to clear the roads. They were full of obstacles, debris, trees and corpses. We worked hard until the roads were clear. As well as that machinery, Kuwait also built a desalination water plant. We opened the first water desalination plant in town, and we were the only ones who had such an installation to treat the seawater. This was very important as the tsunami had destroyed everything and there was no drinking water available, so the risk of disease was high. In the aftermath of the tsunami, with so many countries providing aid, an important challenge became to turn disaster relief into developmental aid. Kuwait's first efforts to bring long-term stability was through the construction of an orphanage for the children who lost their families. KRCS built a two-story building to serve as a boarding school for the children and orphans who were victims of the tsunami. We provided an orphanage, housing and supplies, books and computers, so that the children could envisage a normal life with an education. Kuwait decided to build the Sheikh Jaba al Saba village, named in honour of the late Emir to Kuwait. They built 150 housing units for tsunami victims accompanied with a school, a clinic, amongst other facilities. It's comfortable, safe, secure, and there is a strong bond between everyone in the village. We're really grateful to the people of Kuwait because they helped us when we were in a very difficult situation. They helped us by giving us this nice house. I'm really grateful. Mrs. Yusmeati also manages to grow rice in the fields surrounding her house, a source of income for her and her family. Other local residents like Mrs. Fauziani have even started putting extensions on their donated house. We like the village because there is a school and there is a big community. The Al Mubarakeya school is actually named after the first school in Kuwait that was built in 1912. This school was donated to us from Kuwait by the Kuwait Red Crescent Society. This school caters to all the needs of the children in the local village and also those from poorer backgrounds. This year we have 96 students. In July we'll add another four majors. So overall we'll have seven majors, including automotive technology, cooking and computer manufacturing. Thanks to the efforts of Kuwait and many other countries, cities like Banda Aceh in Indonesia have on a social and infrastructure level been able to modernize in the aftermath of such natural disasters. Unfortunately, in the years that followed this disaster, many more events saw the need for aid and assistance, and Kuwait was once again leading the way both in terms of financial support and relief operations. Another global challenge is the spread of epidemic and endemic diseases, which are becoming more easily transferable with the growth of global interconnectivity. The recent outbreak of Ebola, despite not affecting Kuwait, was an important cause for His Highness the Emir, who donated generously towards immediate scientific research in order to control and eliminate the threat from our global society. The Ebola uh, that we saw in 2014 is the biggest ever. Uh, outbreak in the 40-year history of Ebola. Kuwait has provided $5 million uh, for the big toe. We put those money to good use to strengthen surveillance and then to hire people to do contact tracing. The outbreak started with one case and the outbreak will end with one case. We are still far from it and it takes a lot of energy not to let go at this point in time. Unfortunately, it is not just natural disasters and disease that can lead to such devastation and displacement. Some of the worst disasters are man-made. For more than three years, 
We have witnessed an unfolding humanitarian catastrophe. We have seen the terrible consequences of conflict. Communities in ruins, economies in free fall. Women and children struck down by bombs, guns, and chemical weapons. Terrorized families running for their lives. If you look at the crisis in Syria, we now have a worsening situation. We have 12 million people in the country that are in need of assistance. Uh, we have four out of five people who are uh, in uh, poverty. This is in a country which uh, five years ago was a middle income country. Essential infrastructure destroyed and over four million people who have fled the country and are seeking refuge in neighboring countries. Jordan welcomes a lot of people. I live in this country and I appreciate the support they've given us. But at the same time, everyone feels better in his own country and with the people he knows. It's difficult to find a job here as many people are poor like us. After several jobs, I came to the market and I started selling vegetables and fruits. I've been doing this for a year, but the income is not enough to feed my whole family. We left our neighbours, we left our house, we came here and adapted to the new situation. Without neighbours, without a place to stay, our whole standard of living has changed. At the beginning when we came, things were difficult. You could not distinguish your own neighbour because of the large number of tents. It was crowded. At the beginning it was very hard. Both winter and summer were very hard. Step by step we managed to cope with the situation. Things started to improve. Water and electricity supply became better. The hospitals are less crowded now. We have been given pre-charged debit cards, which make it easier to buy our things. Many things in the camp have improved. We are in the Kuwait section, and there is safety here. Thank you, Kuwait. Without the support of concerted international aid and collaboration, neighbouring countries would not be in a position to take in the staggering number of Syrian refugees. Kuwait's role has been to act as a galvanizer in persuading the international community into action, whilst itself providing vital funds to ensure the displaced refugees have food, water and shelter. We have many projects, but the most prominent now are those in Syria, among which is the Bread Project, which aims to aid Syrian families. Over 50 million loaves of bread in Lebanon and Jordan have been delivered to Syrian families. The project is a Kuwaiti initiative. These poor people left their home, their country, and they've come here with nothing. Our bakery is surrounded by six Syrian refugee camps. So I think that by helping them with two bags of bread per day is the very least we can do. However, considering the protracted nature of this humanitarian crisis, aid organizations are having to turn crisis aid into long-term development projects. And usually when we look at the four years of crisis, we have the impression that this is just accumulating the numbers, getting more refugees, more displaced people. But we don't look at the way that these people, you know, the condition of, of life, they are completely, you know, this is a, a huge problem of impoverishment. We are trying with a, a Kuwait Development Fund to look at the way that we move from water tracking to water extraction, when we move to couch voucher support to employment generation, if we move from, uh, uh, from food assistance to food production. As the number of Syrian refugees in neighboring countries continues to grow, ensuring access to quality health care is becoming an increasing challenge. So Kuwait's additional donation recently of $110 million for UNHCR's Syria crisis operations came at an ideal time. When the UNHCR gave the association the right to provide medical support for the refugees and pay for it, we were very happy. And the Syrian refugees can now start benefiting from the medical services we provide, which include pediatric medicine, reproductive health, dentistry, heart and stomach specializations, and chronic disease treatment.
With the capacity in refugee camps now stretched to an all-time high, nearly 80% of the refugees are actually having to find shelter in the host communities. But as their vulnerability has deepened, more and more have had to resort to living in abandoned buildings, garages, sheds, work sites and informal settlements. Through the financing provided by Kuwait to UN agencies, Salim and his family moved to a new rented house very recently. We lived in several areas before moving here. It was very hard on the children. But now we are happy, comfortable and feel more secure. We cannot afford the house's rent. Now we do not pay anything. UNHCR settled us here. We feel comfortable. All the community is very kind. When you have 100,000 refugees in a country, you have a refugee problem. When you have 1.2 million, and they make up 25% of the population of your country, you have a national problem. There is no country in the world that has so many refugees per capita as Lebanon. It's very important that uh, we, we bridge this gap between humanitarian aid for the main purpose of life-saving to more uh, long-term development. We're recognizing the need to, yes, support the Syrians as, who have lost everything, but also those host communities, particularly the really poor, who are hosting them. We are in front of a crisis that is going beyond the standard boundaries. What we need to offer for this exceptional crisis is a, a exceptional means. No, we need to think about out, out of the box. As the largest humanitarian disaster since World War II, this crisis needs all of the international community to pull together. Kuwait has been an exceptional leader in this regard. It has hosted three pledging conferences successively every year since 2013. The first two conferences raised $3.9 billion collectively and $3.8 billion in the last conference alone with Kuwait pledging $1.3 billion of the total amount. But what Kuwait does is to provide a platform for discussion of the major humanitarian challenges. And then, of course, there is Kuwait's diplomacy and the work that uh, Kuwait does as an active uh, political uh, partner in seeking resolution of so many of the conflicts in this region. This country has led the way, already organized three pledging conferences, mobilized uh, the global community at the highest level, made the, probably the largest contribution in all three occasions, motivated others to come forward. I think that's, you can't find a better example than this, really, you know. The United Nations Award is a testament to the generosity of the people of Kuwait. But to really understand that generosity, one has to search deeper in Kuwait's legacy. There are many motives. Islam is not the only religion that promotes charity work. All religions promote charity and helping those in need. Of course, religion has a bit, it plays a major role, but I don't think religion is effective unless you hold humanity to be your top priority, to have some sort of empathy and compassion, and you hold it dear to your heart. And I think it's something that we as a population, as a community in Kuwait, we feel very strongly about, especially after the war, after the Iraq war, when we were invaded by our neighbors. The population of Kuwait witnessed what it means to lose your country and to be a refugee. So they do know the, the suffering of somebody lost his land, somebody lost his home, and how can they return this by doing the same, just to at least minimize the suffering that they're going through right now. Look at Iraq, you know, I mean, there's a painful history between Kuwait and Iraq. But see how the transformation, how the leadership is responding. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that every year there is a compensation which Iraq has to make for the reasons well known. But this year, because of the internal, you know, sort of more demands, needs and economic pressures within Iraq, they were not in a position to give that a particular amount this year to make that contribution. So they made a request to Kuwait, can you please give us more time? They agreed, the leadership agreed. We've been giving um, the, some people would call it the good fortune of having resources that many other countries don't have. So we tend to like to share these resources. 
uh, with people that need them around the world. And I think just over the years and decades, uh, our young men and women have grown up with that. It's become a norm for us. So our volunteer, the tradition of volunteerism in Kuwait is very strong. The good thing about here in Kuwait, you will see tens if not hundreds of small charities that they're really helping uh, societies all over the world, regardless of race, religion, or location. With such energy from the civic society in Kuwait, volunteerism has become an integral part of youth development in the country. The youth started to like it. They felt responsible, they felt loved, and they felt peaceful. Through community service, we think the youth can find a sense of purpose, and when you find a sense of purpose, you find God. I remember one house that we worked on in uh, Lebanon. I can remember the kitchen was with the bathroom. Can you imagine it was like in one place, there was no separation in between. They had like four children, and they're all sick all the time. The house was unhealthy to live in. We find a solution how to uh, separate the, the kitchen from the uh, bathroom. It took us like uh, two weeks. I saw the, the, tears, the tears of joy, um, but I was like, okay, I should give more. I should give more to the people who need like, such a project like this. Humanitarian work knows no boundaries, limitations, or nationalities. Kuwait and His Highness earned that title and is going for more, using the help of its young people. In the legacy that Kuwait leaves for its young people will serve as an inspiration, a blueprint for the true meaning of global citizenship. Its humanitarian endeavors are now deeply entwined within the country's cultural DNA. Never has the world needed this attitude of fraternity as much as it does now. Our globalized, technologically advanced planet provides almost unimaginable opportunities to many, but this only makes the desperate situation of others all the more poignant and unsettling. As a human race, we are at our best when we are willing to sacrifice for the betterment of others. Kuwait's leadership in the humanitarian field serves as an example to the wider international community for what it means to be at the front line.